Okay, so uh, we have this split into both our sophomore information and our junior information that I have listed here. Uh, sophomores should have at least nine credits earned at this point. So that is six from their freshman year and three from the first semester of their sophomore year. By the end of this school year, you will have hopefully at least 12 credits completed by the end of this school year. Uh, your GPA needs to be at least a 2.0 or above. And if, it, if it is under a 2.0 or you are missing credits, then we have some opportunities to speak with you about that as well. Uh, to make up credits and also increase your GPA. Uh, sophomores, if you took Algebra 1 in ninth grade, unfortunately, we missed out on our EOCs at the end of last year when we were not physically in school. So they have been making up their Algebra 1 EOCs for sophomores all year this year. If you have not taken an Algebra 1 EOC as of yet, there is still time to complete that before the end of the year. That is a graduation requirement. Uh, so you must pass the Algebra One EOC in order to graduate. Uh, if you took geometry last year as a freshman, uh, then again, you didn't get to take the EOC. So you were probably making that up this year. Uh, and also if you took geometry at uh, geometry this year as a sophomore, you will be taking the EOC at the end of the year. Same thing for biology. Uh, some of you may have taken biology as a freshman, but did not get to take the EOC. Uh, and if you're taking biology this year as a sophomore, you again will be taking the EOC at the end of the year. Um, all sophomores have had the opportunity to take the PSAT this year. And we offered that both in October and January this year. Um, so hopefully everyone was able to use that opportunity to take the PSAT, which is the practice or the pre-SAT. Um, we actually just received those results and I have the paper results that I will be going into the sophomore English classes uh, in the next week or two to give out those results and go over um, what the scores are and what the scores mean. Uh, also, another graduation requirement uh, is an online class. If you have not completed an online class at this point, that is something that you need to put on your to-do list. That goes for both sophomores and juniors. Um, everyone must complete an online class. That is a graduation requirement. All right, on our juniors list, you should have earned at least 15 credits at this point, six from freshman year, six from sophomore year, and three from the first semester of your junior year. Therefore, you should already have 15 credits. Um, by the end of this school year, you will have 18 credits. And your cumulative GPA, again, needs to be at least a 2.0, if not above. Um, you will be taking, I say the juniors did not get to take their FSA for the ELA 10th grade at the end of last year, since again, we were not in school. Uh, they have been making that up all throughout the year this year. Um, as a junior, if you have not taken the FSA ELA grade 10 assessment, uh, that is something that needs to be a very high priority. That is a graduation requirement and you must pass that test in order to earn a diploma. Uh, so we are still testing for the FSA ELA. So if you are a junior and you have not taken that test yet this year, you definitely need to contact myself, your counselor, your assistant principal. Uh, that needs to be something that needs to happen immediately. Um, also for my juniors, more than likely you're in US history, you will be taking the US history EOC um, by the end of the year. Uh, also as a junior, hopefully I've had these conversations with in many of the junior English classes this year um, about starting to take your ACT and SAT, not only for college and university admissions, uh, but because they can sub in scores for that Algebra One EOC and the FSA ELA test that are both graduation requirements. 
Uh, and again, if you have not taken an online class, that is something that is required for graduation. So I know that was a ton of information just to start off with. Um, and I'm sure many of you are going, well, how do I know how many credits I've earned at this point? And where do I find my cumulative GPA? Well, don't worry, I have that info just for you. So how to find your GPA and how many credits you've earned. If your student signs into their My Student account, or if you have a parent account on My Student, uh, you will, from the portal uh, homepage, you will select the Reports tab. Then okay. under the Reports tab, you would be able to select the report card from 3.30. So it's going to be very up-to-date, accurate information. That report card just came out this week. Then you will be able to see the you will be able to see the cumulative GPA. This includes all of the grades that you've ever received for any high school level course that you've taken. Uh, even if you took some high school level courses in middle school, so some of you may have taken Algebra One, Digital Info Tech, uh, Ag, Agriculture, Science One. Uh, those are all high school level courses, so they will show up on your. Uh, transcripts and will be included in your GPA. Uh, also, you will be able to add up all the credits that you have earned. So I do have a screenshot of what your report card looks like. So here is a student report card. I pulled it just the way I gave the instructions. I have circled down here in the bottom. This is the cumulative GPA. Off to the right, it says current quarter, weighted and unweighted GPA. This is not what will help you graduate. This is the GPA that we look at, the cumulative GPA, because the quarter GPA is only what is on this report card right here in third quarter. The cumulative GPA is all the classes you've ever taken in high school, which is what uh, we look at for graduation purposes, for scholarships, uh, for college admission, they're looking at your cumulative GPA. So we have both the weighted and unweighted GPA. For the credits earned, let's say these are the required credits in all of the different areas that you can earn credits. This is currently what the student has earned. This is what is still needed to meet the 24 credit standard diploma. So if you add up these numbers in the earned column, and as a sophomore, you are below the nine credits currently, you are behind. You have either failed a class or missed a class somehow. Um, as a junior, if your earned credits, what is in this column does not add up to at least 15 credits at this point, um, you are behind as well. Questions on the GPA, the credits, what do we do if we add up these earned credits and we see that we only have, you know, 13 credits as a junior instead of 15? Uh, that means that at some point during your high school courses, you have failed a course uh, and you need to make up that course or when we get to the end, you won't have enough credits to graduate. Uh, to do that, we at this point uh, are telling everyone that they will be signing up for summer school because that is our next opportunity for you to make up credits. Uh, summer school will be this summer. Um, I believe our location for summer school will be at Stewart Middle School, since we are still in the middle of a lot of construction and remodeling. Um, and in order to sign up for summer school for this summer, you need to contact your assistant principal. So for the 10th graders, that would be Ms. Watkins. For the 11th graders, that would be Mr. Hayes. Say, Ms. Yankoff, do we have any additional information on summer school? 
Um, not much more, but uh, that's basically what it is. We, it, we do anticipate it being in person for the most part um, because students are, they tend to be more successful that way. So we anticipate having that at um, Stewart Middle School in person. And um, we also are thinking that, um, that there may be like a rolling enrollment, like where you can start. And then if you finish, you're done. You don't have to stay the whole entire time. Um, so if you only have like one class to make up, you would just make up the one class. So uh, we do call that extended school year usually, but uh, we, we end up you know, referring to it as, as summer school. Um, but really you know, the official name is extended school year. And that usually starts a week or two after um, the last day of school. And it goes through July. Awesome. I see that we have a hand up. Does someone have a question specifically? What is the easiest way to schedule a meeting with you guys? Uh, if you reach out to one of us by email, if there's someone specific that you would like to have a meeting with, that's usually the best way to get a hold of us since many of us are in and out of our offices quite often. <laughs> so email would be the best way to um, set up a meeting directly. There's also on the Thank school you. website, there's a, there's a location for um, you to schedule a meeting with a counselor or um, Ms. Simons on the school website. Uh, like it, it, I think it says request an appointment underneath um, the students tab. And that's another way of, of getting a hold of the counselor or Ms. Simon. Yes. And I think all of our email addresses are on um, the school website as well. Our, yes, they're on the school website. I also will have them on um, a screen at the end of this presentation. So you guys can take a picture or a screenshot of all the email addresses as well. All right, so GPA, cumulative GPA, credits earned, um, and then the test assessment information, since we're already on um, the report card, you can see that test information here at the bottom. Uh, it says student met assessment requirement in, and then it lists all the different tests, all the EOCs and FSAs that I've been mentioning, um, and if they have met their online course requirement. So if there is a date listed, after the test, that means that is the date that your student met that test requirement or passed that test. If it is blank, that means that the student has not passed that test at, at this point. Also on the, where it says online, it'll either say met or not met. So that means this student in particular still has not completed their online course. They have completed and passed their math test. They have not passed their reading test, which is the FSA ELA grade 10 assessment. So this is one way to check those test requirements. However, the report cards only come out um, you know, two times a year, so after each semester. Another way to check on those uh, tests scores and if they've met those requirements uh, is by looking in my student. So I actually have a screenshot of that as well. So in the um, students, my student account, if they click on test history from this menu bar here on the left hand side, they click on test history, this screen will come up. Uh, up here, it gives you that same information. However, this screen is updated consistently throughout the year as we receive test scores. Um, when your students take the test and the test scores come in, they automatically will update in your My Student account. So you can see the dates that the student has passed a test, or if it is blank, again, that means that the student either has not even sat for that test or has not passed that test. And again, for the online course requirement, it will say met or not met. Questions on testing information and how to know if you've met those requirements or not. Okay, I saw another thing come up in the chat. 
Uh, when determining the GPA, do you average the two semester grades or do they get points per semester? Ms. Yonkok, would you like to answer that question for us? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So GPA is by semesters. Um, some states go by uh, uh, year long grades. Um, we generally go by semesters, even if it is a year long class and that's how the GPA is determined. Uh, and so, um, and that way, if a student finishes one semester and then switches to a different subject, then they'll still get the credit for that semester. If we did it by year, then they would have lost a whole semester of, um, of credit. So that's why we do it that way. If they fail a semester, but they pass the other and the other semester is enough to average out, then we'll actually go with a year credit for that student. So that's um, why sometimes we're like, hey, you got like a 55 first semester, all you need is like a 65 and you'll pass with a D. Um, you know, that's when we can say that's how the year long, but outside of that, it's always semester. Yes, so the GPA updates twice a year. Their cumulative GPA will update twice a year after first semester and then after the end of the school year, they will again have their GPA updated. All right, so um, another point of testing would be the SAT. Uh, currently, the SAT cost $52, um, and you can register. You don't register through the school. You actually register at sat.org or collegeboard.org. They will take you to the same place. Um, and the SAT can sub in for both the reading requirement for graduation and the math requirement for graduation, which is the Algebra One EOC test. The ACT is another test that is an opportunity for students uh, to meet those testing requirements, both the Algebra One and the FSA reading test. Um, you can again register online at actstudent.org. The current cost for that test is $55. Uh, both ACT and SAT are college entrance exams. Um, so I usually always get asked by students, which one is easier? Well, neither. They're college entrance exams. They're not meant to be easy. However, there are um, many you know, opportunities for uh, study information, study guides, test prep uh, information. I do have free study guides that I hand out to students. Um, there's many websites they can go to to get free practice for ACT and SAT uh, and to help improve their scores. So if you have questions about that specifically, I have done many presentations, um, especially in the junior classes this year about ACT and SAT, what, they're, what they are, what they're used for, both for concordance scores for graduation uh, and for college admissions and um, scholarships as well. If you and your family, your student uh, qualifies for free or reduced lunch, there are also fee waivers available for students to take these tests because they are a, a bit of a hefty amount to pay for them. Um, so they're currently students receive four ACT fee waivers. So you can take the ACT four times for free as a student who qualifies for free or reduced lunch. Um, SAT currently has, is two fee waivers that are available for students. So total, <clears throat> excuse me, total you get six free tests um, by just, and to get those fee waivers, you just have to come see me. I'm the holder of the waivers, um, but you can also email me and I can send you that information if that's not something that your student can can find me or um, if you have an MSO student, they can email me directly and I can give them that information. Okay, so before I go to success skills, any other questions on ACT, SAT, fee waivers? Um, didn't they just take the SAT? Yes, all 11th grade students did take the SAT school day, um, I believe to say it was the week we came back from spring break last week. Uh, and that was actually paid for by the district. So that's not something we always count on. We don't know um, if that is going to happen from year to year based on budgets and whatnot. Um, 
But yes, this year, the all 11th grade students were able to take the SAT during the school day um, and it was paid for by district. So that was a great opportunity. Um, that may or may not be something that is available uh, to for students next year. So we just kind of have to wait and see. Uh, can a student retake a class if available via online in hopes of raising their low GPA? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they can take a class, retake a class um, to improve their grade either through Pasco eSchool um, or through FLVS. However, it has to be uh, that the first grade they received was a D or an F. So they can only retake a class online if it was a D or an F. All right. Um, there is another hand raised. Do we, do we have another question? Uh, da -da. Uh, well, Go ahead, Michelle. Okay. Um, I guess two questions. Mm -hmm. um, how it, or where is the best place to look for the online class that they have to do? And second, would there be any kind of because algebra type boot camp for my child to pass? <laughs> okay. Um, I say the online classes, they can choose any online class that they want to take. So they can either take that through Pasco eSchool, which is the Pasco County version um, of FLVS, which is Florida Virtual School. And oh. they can take a class online with either organization. And it okay. is free for them to sign up for either one of those. Um, I say they can find all of the information for Pasco eSchool and FLVS uh, through the district website. Okay. And they can literally choose any class that is available. Oh. And then they sign up for it and then it gets approved by their counselor. Um, now the online course requirement is only that they take an online course. It does not have to be a full credit course. So something like peer counseling is a class that we don't offer at the school level. Um, and it's not a full year course, it's actually half a credit. And it's okay. a half a credit course that they can take online through Pasco eSchool, um, but that will satisfy their online course requirement, even though it's only a half a credit course, as okay. long as they complete the entire course. And they could do that in the summertime too? Yes, ma'am, that would be wonderful. Okay. Yeah, um, driver's ed, peer counseling, there's several half credit courses that many students choose to take uh, over the summer. And that's a great thing. Okay. All right, so uh, moving on to some success skills. If your student uh, needs assistance or just wants to be more successful uh, in school, uh, there are many things that we wanna make sure that you as parents understand that are available to your students. So we do have an academic period every day um, built into our schedule. Some people call it homeroom. It is actually called our academic period. It is between second and third period. It is a 20 minute period uh, that students can use as a study hall. Uh, they can use to go visit another teacher's classroom to get additional help on maybe homework from the night before or a topic they didn't understand from a previous lesson. Uh, that's really the time that students use, need to use that time um, for academic purposes. Uh, if they need to go make up a quiz in another teacher's classroom that maybe they were absent uh, and missed a quiz, that is what that time is dedicated to. Um, they can ask for a pass from the teacher that they would like to go visit. That's the best course of action is to ask for a pass. You know, if, say I'm a student, I need help in math. So I'm going to ask my math teacher, hey, Mrs. Smith, can I have a pass to come see you during academic period? Um, so I can show my homeroom or my academic period teacher this pass and I can come to see you during this time to get additional help. So that is definitely what our academic period uh, is for. 
for those students to seek additional help, uh, to work on homework, to use as a study hall, uh, and they have that additional 20 minutes every day to do so. So please talk with your student and encourage your student not to just use this as chat time, uh, but to use this, you know, as time to get some, some work done, some homework done, some studying done for, a, you know, an upcoming quiz or test or, you know, to make those connections with teachers. We also have peer tutoring during both lunches, both A lunch and B lunch. Um, out in the commons area, we have several tables set up and we have uh, students who volunteer their time during lunch uh, to sit out at those tables and eat their lunch and help other students uh, with, with ever, you know, whatever work or you know, homework or studying for something um, that they need assistance with. We do have adults there to you know, make sure everyone is staying on task um, and to help facilitate, uh, but there are peer tutors there available during both lunches every day of the week. So make sure that if your student is having any trouble that they take advantage of those opportunities. Um, we also have a test retake policy at our school that any uh, summative test can be retaken, that they can take retake it at least twice. So a total of three times to take a test and the highest score would then be added to the grade book. However, in between retaking a test, we do require uh, that they do what's called remediation or you know, if they take a test the first time and they get a 50%, well, obviously there were some topics uh, that were not understood as well as they should have been. So therefore they need to get with that teacher. They need to you know, work on whatever skills they may have missed. That may be doing some additional homework or some remediation, uh, maybe some meetings with the teacher after school or during their academic period to review. Uh, then they can retake that test, hopefully for a higher score say the next time they take it, they get a 65. Okay, well, that was an improvement from a 50, but if the student definitely wants to work on that again and try one more time, again, they would need to go through the remediation process, meet with the teacher, do the additional assigned work or you know, academic period meetings, um, and then retake the test a final time to get the highest score possible. Uh, so that is the retake policy that all students um, are available to take advantage of. All they have to do is speak with their teachers. So if it is a summative test, they can retake that. So that could definitely help improve many grades. So make sure your student is taking advantage of that opportunity. Um, also, just in general, Students should have a specific study area. Um, I get on to my own kids about doing their homework laying in bed because that's really not the best place for you to be doing homework. When you're laying in bed, you're probably you know, much more relaxed and usually that's where you're watching TV or you're getting ready to go to bed or you're talking on the phone. So probably not the best um, area to be working on homework or typing a paper or you know, trying to study. So make sure they have a well-lit specific area that is comfortable for them to be doing their homework. Also, students need to reach out to their teachers. Just like I was talking about with the test retake policy, unless the student takes that initiative to talk to their teacher um, and ask for the remediation and the fact that they do want to retake a test, then the teacher's not gonna know. Um, that's really something that the students need to self-advocate um, and reach out to their teachers, reach out to their administrators. Uh, that's what we're here for. Um, our counseling team is wonderful. So reach out to your teachers and definitely keep the communication lines open. Um, whether that's, you know, students have access to our emails. They can send us messages through our Canvas inbox. Um, and again, we are available during that academic period. So definitely a lot of great opportunities for your student to stay on top of their studies. 
All right, any other questions before we move on to post-secondary options? Because I know that's coming up quickly for lots of students. If I could just so, interject real quick, Ms. Simons, because I had yeah. a couple, couple people direct messaging me, so in case anybody else has questions too. Yeah. So if, if your student took biology last year uh, or geometry, or so biology specifically, we'll focus on that. You do not need to take the retake this year. All students last year for biology had the waiver, and so you do not have to take that test. Beautiful. Okay. All right. Okay, so moving on to post-secondary options. So after high school, we have to start thinking about what, what our students are going to do, or they need to be thinking about that, definitely. So there are many post-secondary options, uh, which include, of course, military entrance, uh, college or university, going to a trade or a vocational school, um, apprenticeships, or going straight into the workforce. So this is what I work with students on specifically. Um, I do presentations both in classrooms and meetings one-on-one -on -one with students and sometimes parents, um, but definitely want them to know that there's lots of different opportunities out there, um, but they definitely need to be thinking about it sooner rather than later. Um, I know that I've talked to all of the juniors class quite often this year. I've done at least two or three presentations um, for junior English classes this year, talking about ACT and SAT and you know college opportunities, um, but also vocational uh, schools. And uh, we do have military recruiters that come um, and that are available to talk to students during lunches. So wanna make sure they know all the opportunities that are available for them. So for military entrance, of course, the student would probably start with talking to a recruiter. Um, the recruiters do come out during lunches to talk with students, but if there is a specific military uh, branch that the student is interested in and would like to speak to someone, they can just contact me or come see me um, during lunches or during their academic period and I can give them that contact information. Uh, I do have contacts for all branches of the military, um, including, let's say the, you know, my brain is blanking on me. Um, let's say all branches, yeah, all of them. <laughs> so I have all of that information. Um, we do have the ASVAB given twice a year. So we normally give it at Zephyr Hills both in November and February. So that is free to the students. And especially if a student is interested in going to the military, they would need to take the ASVAB and they can take that multiple times uh, before graduation to increase their scores so that they are um, available to have choices in what their jobs would be in the military. All right, also um, just FYI, you must receive your high school diploma to go into the military. They do not accept a certificate of completion. All right, so a little bit more information about the ASVAB. Um, it is also a career exploration program. So if your student is still very unknown on what they wanna do after high school, the ASVAB is a great test that includes both their interest assessment and career planning tools um, to help that student see, you know, what different opportunities are out there and are available. Um, and that, you know, would match both their interest and abilities. So the ASVAB is a great tool that we use. If your student did not receive their test scores, that's because they didn't come get them from me. <laughs> um, say the ASVAB, they do not come digitally, so they are not uploaded in my student. Uh, they, the reports do come in paper reports. Um, I usually get them out during lunches, and unfortunately, sometimes it's difficult to get those to all the students. 
so if your student did take the ASVAB, they can come see me directly. I do have all their reports. All right, so on to university or college admissions. Um, if your student is looking to go directly into a university, being USF, FSU, UF, uh, directly after high school, um, these are the requirements that they'll be needing to attain. So at least 18 academic credits. So that's what the colleges will look at. English, math, science, social studies, and two years of a foreign language. Um, they will have 24 credits total, but the universities do a recalculation on their GPA based on the academic credits only. So that would not include things like driver's ed and chorus and ROTC, anything like that. For university admissions, um, they will do a recalculated GPA. They do need two years of the same foreign language, whether that's sign language, Spanish, French, um, just two years of the same foreign language. So Spanish one and two, sign language one and two, um, any of those would be great. Uh, they need to take the ACT and SAT. I know there has been a lot of talk and speculation over the past year about colleges and universities not meeting test scores for college and university admissions. However, I will tell you that the Board of Governors for the state of Florida, which is the 12 state universities for the state of Florida, um, have decided as a cumulative that they are still requiring ACT and SAT scores for college admissions. Um, some smaller schools or private schools have made their own decisions and are not requiring ACT and SAT scores. But I will tell you that across the board, the majority of schools are still looking at those test scores and requiring that for admissions. Also, your test scores and GPAs must be competitive if you are looking to go to a large university. Um, there are universities for all levels of students, um, but depending on what schools you're looking to go into, that's definitely some research that you need to do beforehand so you know, you know where your best fit school is going to be. Also, this is usually a big wow to a lot of students and parents, um, but the more information you know, the sooner I think is the better way to go. So a public two-year college, this would be such as PHSC, so Polk, um, Polk, Polk, listen to me, Pasco Hernando State College, Polk State College, HCC, which is Hillsborough Community College, uh, these are the two-year state colleges that for tuition and fees for in-state, which tuition, which would be us, uh, is right around $3,500 a year. So this would be for about 30 credit hours. To get an associate's degree, which is a two-year degree, usually is about 60 credit hours. So you would move on from a public two-year college um, for right around seven grand for the first two years of college. At a public four-year university, tuition and fees for in-state, this would include USF, UCF, UF, FSU, they're all very similar in their tuition rates. Uh, this is right around $9,500 a year. Again, this is just for tuition and fees. This does not include housing, um, you know, room and board, transportation, those kind of things. This is just tuition. Um, so right around, you know, a little over $9,000 a year. Uh, a public four-year college for out-of-state. So this would be like Valdosta State or you know anywhere outside of the state of Florida. Uh, you're looking right around $25,000 a year uh, for tuition and fees because out-of-state is about three to four times as much as in-state tuition. So for your student to stay in the state of Florida is much more cost-effective. 
Uh, also for a private four-year college in state or out of state is going to run you at least $30,000 to $45,000 a year. Um, and again, that's only for tuition and fees. Uh, so this would be schools like St. Leo, University of Miami, Florida Southern. Um, so just be aware that, you know, the, these are the current prices for tuition. Um, and I think that's, it's a big eye opener for a lot of, a lot of students because they don't understand that's how much school costs. However, there are lots of ways to afford going to school to make it very economical. Uh, and I work with stu students quite often um, working on scholarships and financial aid. So there are lots of different ways to make this very affordable. So this is just a map wanted to show you. This is the 12 state universities and two additional universities that they added on here. But we do have some great schools in the state of Florida. And I mean, if your student wants to go far away, they can go to University of West Florida and still be, you know, eight hours away from home. So, or they can go as close by as USF or Florida Poly and be within an hour's drive. So um, lots right. of different options. Exactly what I wanted to see and I missed it. So another, um, Another opportunity to make things very affordable for college is the Bright Futures Scholarship Program. I like to cover this one specifically because it is the largest scholarship program in the state of Florida for state of Florida students. So there are three levels of Bright Futures Scholarship Program. There's the Florida Academic Scholars, the Florida Medallion Scholars, and the Vocational Gold Seal Scholars. Um, I do have the Bright Futures website there below because there are a lot of intricacies that come along with this scholarship and the requirements. I'm going to give you the basic requirements, but of course there's always additional questions. So I like to direct you to the website first because they do have um, extensive handbooks that explain all the different requirements uh, and what you can do with these scholarships. So the academic scholars, which is the 100% tuition and fees requirements are uh, a 1330 on the SAT or a 29 on the ACT, at least a 3.5 weighted GPA in your core academic courses. So just like I was talking about the universities do a recalculated GPA of the academic courses. So does the Bright Futures Scholarship. Um, so again, that GPA would not include driver's ed and chorus and, you know, medical skills class because that is not included in the academic courses. Um, they will need to achieve at least 100 community service hours and again, two years of a foreign language. For the Florida Medallion Scholars, which is the 75% tuition and fee scholarship, they would need to achieve a 1210 on the SAT or at least a 25 on their ACT, have a 3.0 weighted GPA, again, in the core academic courses, 75 community service hours, and again, two years of a foreign language. The Gold Seal Vocational Scholars, this actually pays a flat rate uh, per credit hour, and that changes from year to year based on the budgets. Um, I believe currently it's paying at $42 per credit hour. So again, they can meet the requirements for this scholarship by either the SAT, the ACT, or the PERT test. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that they can meet the requirements. Uh, they need to have at least a 3.0 in their core academic courses and a 3.5 in at least three sequential and approved vocational courses. So this would be our CTE courses, uh, career and technical education. So such as our criminal justice program, there is criminal justice one through four. If they take at least three of those courses and have a 3.5 GPA in those criminal justice courses, that's how they qualify for the vocational scholars program. 
again, they would need at least 30 hours of community service. Any additional questions on the Bright Futures stuff before I move on? Mm -hmm. Let's see any additional questions in the chat. So I'm gonna keep moving. All right, so especially for our juniors, here is your senior year college timeline if that is your choice for your post-secondary. Um, Things start very quickly after the summer. So definitely if you have not taken your ACT or SAT, my recommendation is that you sign up for one. Um, for over the summer, there is both a May, June and July test dates still available. Um, so if you are either not happy with your ACT or SAT scores, or if you have not taken one yet, um, I would definitely recommend you sign up ASAP because you need to have test scores before the start of your senior year if you are looking to apply to a four-year university. So timeline will start in September for our seniors. Um, meet with either your counselor, your career specialist, to discuss your college plans if you have not already. Um, go over your test scores and determine if you need to retake. Well, I'm telling you that now. <laughs> It is April of your junior year. If you are not happy with your test scores, you need to retake them. Uh, the sooner the better. October is when you are going to be completing your applications for college. Um, actually, most college applications open sometime between August and September. And the big deadline statewide for universities is November 1st. So, if you are looking to apply to a four-year university, so I'm not talking about PHSC or um, you know a smaller school, maybe St. Leo or Florida Southern. Those are private schools. They have their own timelines. Um, I'm talking about USF, UF, FSU, UCF. They all have an application deadline of November 1st. So get that date on your calendar that your applications need to be complete before November 1st. Um, again, if you're not happy with your test scores, you're going to be able to retake your ACT and SAT even after you apply to college because you can always send in your test scores after you have applied um, so that you can continue to improve those scores. Also, uh, to add to your timeline as a senior, October 1st is the first day that the FAFSA application opens. This is the federal application for student aid. So this is the application that you will fill out both the students and the parents and submit to the federal government for free money to go to college. So, and there will be much more information shared with the seniors at the beginning of their senior year on how to complete the FAFSA and again, reiterating those deadlines. Uh, so for November, we say continue to work on community service hours. Um, the sooner you can get your community service hours taken care of, of course, the better. Uh, again, retaking the ACT and SAT, it is offered almost every month. Um, March, I would say January through March, seek out and complete local scholarship opportunities. Um, I do all the local uh, scholarships as well. So those usually do come available right around spring break time um, and are quite active right now through May. So um, that is something that, again, I will announce to all of the seniors. It is posted on my website. I send it out in Canvas, on Twitter, on Facebook. So as much information I can get out there uh, to the students to fill out those scholarship applications to make sure that you know, they're getting as much money as they possibly can to go to college. Uh, in April of your senior year, you're going to be deciding which college to attend uh, and putting down housing deposits uh, or deposits for, you know, holding your spot there at the school. Um, so that usually hope it happens in April because decision day is May 1st when all schools ask that you make your decision. 
Uh, how soon can you fill out college applications is that a question that we have in the chat. Um, college applications usually do not open until August or September of the student's senior year. So the student would need to wait until their class year application is open. So juniors cannot currently apply to college, um, but the applications will open usually in August, September of their senior year. All right, so this is just a screenshot of my website. This is the College and Career Resource Center. Um, as you can see, the different tabs, lots of the information that I've spoken about both tonight and that I've done presentations with uh, for many of the students. This information is also available on my website, which can be um, you know, linked to from the ZHS website. And all right, so here is your contact information. So both for myself, for Ms. Watkins, for Mr. Hayes, um, and also I say I do have a Twitter account as well, which is at ZHSCCRC, uh, and my website information is here as well. Say, do we have any additional questions that I? Didn't catch in the chat box. I say in the last administration of the SAT, the one that all 11th graders took just last week, um, usually takes about four to six weeks to receive those results. So hopefully by the end of April, if not the beginning of May, we should have um, those results for any student that took the SAT. Uh, when taking the SAT, what parts should they sign up for? They don't get to choose to only sign up for certain parts. When you sign up for the ACT or SAT, you will take the entire test. So for the SAT, there's two major sections, an evidence-based reading and writing and the math sections. Uh, so they have to take the entire test. The only thing that is an option is whether or not they take the uh, essay portion of the test, which is in addition to the multiple choice uh, sections. And from my experience, uh, there are no schools in the state of Florida, at least public universities in the state of Florida, that require the essay sections of either the ACT or SAT. Um, so my advice to most students is not to sign up for it. <laughs> um, it is a it, it adds about an hour and a half to the ACT or SAT. Um, and after taking a four hour multiple choice test, most students don't wanna do another hour and a half of writing. Um, and honestly, it's usually not to their benefit. Um, so I would just have the students concentrate on the multiple choice section of the tests. Yes, ma'am, you have a question? Go ahead. I do have a question. Um, some students took the SAT um, on the 13th of March, mm -hmm. which was before the junior one. Yes. Um, those results came back today. You guys said that on the report card portion, it updated, or on, um, excuse me, on the online portal, it updated. Are those results in yet for requirements being met? No, I would say if the, if the results just came back to students today, um, it usually takes two to three weeks for that information to, because they also send that to district directly, um, you know, in a digital upload, and then that will be updated in my student. So it usually does take, you know, at least three to four weeks for that information to get updated in my student. Um, but of course, that's much quicker than waiting for the next report card. So how would they find out, um, or is there a way to find out if the SAT scores that came in were high enough to meet the, the requirements for graduation? Yes, um, I would say they can contact me directly. They can ask their counselors, um, any of their administrators. Um, also that information is published out there what the concordance score requirements are uh, for both the reading requirement and for the math requirement. So yeah, there are specific scores that they need to meet. So 
Okay, well, I wanna see, sorry, I'm looking at the... Any other questions that I may have missed in the chat, either for me or any of the other super special people in this call? <laughs> How, how soon do they need to get those community service hours in order to um, qualify for those those biggest of those um, scholarships? So the, the way that it's written through Bright Futures is that all, all requirements must be met by the date of graduation. So however, I will tell you that as the person who has to approve all of those hours, the sooner the better. Um, yeah, I, it usually doesn't make me extremely happy when it's the week before graduation and I have a senior hand me four years worth of community service hours that need to be approved and entered and signed off on and whatnot. So the sooner the better. Um, I usually tell students as they complete their community service and fill out the forms to turn them in. I mean, because then they can continue to see their progress um as they achieve that because that can also be seen um, in their my student portal they can see how many community service hours they have logged up to this point yep. um, the only thing that they can still work on after the actual date of graduation is the testing uh, because act and sat always have a june test date that bright futures will accept the June test dates for meeting the test requirements, but everything else has to be completed prior to the date of graduation. Any other questions? I know we have one additional portion to this um, informational meeting tonight, and that is about our dual enrollment. So I'll say, Ms. Yonkoff, are we ready to move on to our dual enrollment section? Yes, so um, we'll, we're gonna go on to dual enrollment and that's where students are enrolled um, in both high school and in college classes. So if that's something that interests you for your student or if you are a student interested in that, then um, we encourage you to stay on this meeting. If that is not something that interests you, you are welcome to leave at this time. and. Um, or maybe send some direct messages to um, um, any of the other people. I do apologize, I have a lot of dogs in my house. <laughs> so we'll give a minute to transition and then we'll be back on this. Yes, I said those are Miss Yonkoff's fur babies. All right, so I have... Great job, Ms. Simons, you did awesome. Well, thank you very much. Always <laughs> because I have wonderful guidance <laughs> from people like you. Okay, so um, Ms. Simons, do you have the dual enrollment? Um... Yes, ma'am, I'm trying to share that, but give me just a moment. <laughs> While you do that, let me do a few um, like, introductory type things. Sure. Uh, so with dual enrollment, there are um, there are some requirements and not everybody's aware of this. For the students who um, intend to perhaps take classes, you do have to pass uh, the, the tests. Um, they, they were a little nicer about it this most previous year because they had removed the opportunity for all those tests because of the pandemic. But this next coming year, all those tests will be back to being required. You can pass the test by multiple ways. One is the PERT, um, which stands for post-secondary education, something readiness test. And, um, and that, that basically shows how much you're ready for college. And then another, another way you can pass it is through your ACT or SAT. Um, and, then I, and then they also have um, all of that information is gonna be on one of the websites that we'll show here shortly after um, we go through the, the presentation. So I'll show you how you can access all that information and know exactly what you need to pass. 
Um, PERT gets confusing because we talk about PERT for um, some students who qualify to take it for their graduation requirements, but that's actually going to be ending with this year's seniors. So from um, your groups, for your students, uh, upcoming 11th and 12th grade students, um, the PERT will only be used for uh, college readiness and whether or not they're um, going to be going to dual enrollment or after after our high school if they're going to go to PHSC in general. So that's the, one of the reasons or that's one of the things for requirements for dual enrollment. Another requirement is a 3.0 GPA for um, high school courses. And then if you are currently taking dual enrollment classes, then you also need to maintain um, a minimum of a 3.0 GPA with uh, with PHSC. I think it's 3.0. And yes. if, yeah, if you don't, then even if you might have a 3.0 with high school, but not with um, the dual enrollment classes themselves, they will um, stop you from taking dual enrollment classes. So something that kind of surprises people, you've got to maintain 3.0 with high school GPA and with your dual enrollment GPA. Now, everyone always asks for dual enrollment. They always ask, how on earth do you sign up? Where do you get all this information? What do you do? Where do we start? where do we go from here basically? And um, we used to have packets, but then they change every year and so on and so forth. So what we decided to do tonight to make it a little bit different and probably more helpful is um, to have a student expert help with the uh, uh, presentation because the students who do all of the steps are used to what to do better than we are on our end um, as administrators or counselors because all we do is approve the stuff or deny the stuff um, but we don't actually see all the steps leading up to it. So I asked one of our students who has done this for quite a few years already um, to help with a presentation tonight and also get volunteer hours, which we were talking about earlier, and, um, and give kind of like an overview of what you need to do to get started. And if you already have an application to get started, sometimes you forget how to like, you know, get going for all the other steps. So she's going to do um, this little PowerPoint presentation with some video, and then at the end, um, we will take some questions, and uh, that way we can at least help everybody from the point of view that you see it, which is better than the point of view that I see it. So without further ado, our special guest speaker, our student expert extraordinaire, Emily Kirk. All right, Emily, I have your. PowerPoint ready. So you tell me when to move on. Okay, you can um, go ahead and move on. <laughs> um, the first step before you can um, take dual enrollment classes is the application process. So um, everybody can read, so you can read the slide. <laughs> um, the little QR code, it will take you directly to PHSC's website to um, apply. It'll take you right to the click now to apply. So that's that. And then there is a video on the next slide that goes in more detail. The sound's not working, is it? It is, it's just very low. Okay, you can just turn it down and I'll talk while it's going. So um, you'll go to PHSC's website and then under, can you go ahead and restart the video? Sorry about that. So this is what PHSC's website looks like. And then for your dual enrollment information, you'll go under the academics section. Um, it will click there in a moment. And then you'll scroll down to the high school programs. And then this shows um, a little bit of information and then there will be some links on the side, but you will click on the dual enrollment program and it'll expand more tabs for you. You'll then select the application on the right hand side. And it will click, it will populate a link. 
and it will take you to this website where you click I'm ready to continue. And then it will screen will prompt you with that information. So make sure you have your social security number and um, your like official name and that kind of thing. And it will walk you through the steps. And that is how you apply. You will get an email um, like saying like you've been approved admissions and then you'll get um, more information in that email, like with specific directions on how to like reset your password and that kind of thing. So you can go on. So before you can take any classes, you have to fill out a dual enrollment request form. So um, sometimes it's called a dynamic form. It'll, you list 14 classes you wanna take. And then if you're unable to, um, like ineligible to take that class, it'll be declined by the, your guidance counselor or the PHSC advisor. And then you have to add up to 14 classes because you don't always get to take the class you want to take. But if you don't put the class on your form, you're not able to take any classes. So you have to make sure even if you not, don't necessarily want to take that class, if you're willing to take it, if you need to like fill a class period or if it meets another requirement, um, it's very important that you put both of those, all of the classes on there. Okay, you can go to the next one. So your dynamic form will be located um, in the same section. So you'll go to academics, scroll back down to high school programs, click the dual enrollment program tab on the left-hand side. Then you'll wanna click the charter and public schools tab, which will populate more step-by-step -step directions. So if you ever get confused on what to do, there's step-by-step -step instructions. And then um, completing your dual enrollment request form is step four. So you'll click that and then there'll be a link. And then you can click the link. And sometimes that doesn't work. So you'll click the link up top. And then it will prompt you to fill out your information. Um, it doesn't let you show that because you have to type in like all of your information, like your PHSC ID, and that kind of thing, which you guys will all have once you get your admissions approval. You can move on. This is what a completed dynamic form will look like. So it'll have, um, so like it'll prompt you on the, like whenever you fill one out to put in like your name, your um, year you graduate, and then this is where you would input all your classes you want to take. So it'll give you a drop down menu and then you can put it on like what campus you want to take it on. So even if you don't necessarily want to take it on campus or you don't want to take it online, it's just easier if you put you'll take it on either one. So if it's not available. You can still take the class and then this will get sent to your parents for them to approve. And if your parents don't approve it, it will never get sent to your guidance counselor for them to approve it. So it's very important that you approve it, your parents approve it, and then it gets sent to your guidance counselor. Well, they'll approve your classes you're gonna take, and then it will get sent to PHSC for the final overview to make sure that everything will match up properly. And then you have to fill a new request form for every term at PHSC. So like, if you wanna take classes during the summer, you have to complete this. If you wanna take them in the fall, you have to make another one with new classes on there. Even so you can put the same class on there multiple times. You just can't take the class more than once. Okay, you can move on. And then um, before you can register for any classes. So this would be something you would do um, like after you get your um, acceptance to PHSC, you have to take a new student orientation and an online readiness course. And these are accessible through Canvas. So similar to like what we use at school, it's just PHSC's Canvas, which the login to that will be provided um, on WISE once you get your acceptance to PHSC. Um, these have to be completed before you can register for classes. So if you don't register, if you don't complete these two online courses, you will not be eligible to enroll in courses. It won't let you register on registration time. 
So when you register for your classes, you'll go onto WISE, which you'll click the register button and it will prompt you with um, drop down menus that you can click from. All the courses that have available seats in them and you're eligible to take will be shown. So if the class is full, it won't show up. If you weren't approved to take the class, it won't show up. And then underneath that, you'll have another another drop down menu where you where it will show the available times, locations, instructors, and like method of instruction. So it'll show you the online classes, the remote classes, the hybrid classes, the in person classes, and it will also show you the campus that they're on, the days of the week they meet. So that's kind of where you get to determine like if that class will even work with your schedule. That's another reason why it's so important to put 14 classes on your form in case a class is full or the day doesn't work with your schedule, you can still enroll in a class. Um, you will then click like add and it will add it to your trial schedule. And then you'll have to finalize your schedule after you add all the classes you would like to take. If you don't finalize your schedule, you won't have a spot in the class. And then you can drop classes and add new classes until the first day of the semester. And then there are specific dates and times for registering depending on your grade level and how many credits you have at PHSC, which I believe is on the next slide. So this is for the summer term. So it will show um, like current high school students in 12th grade, so that'd be rising juniors, um, will register for their online classes on April 28th. And then depending on how many credits you have, depending on what time you can register. And then um, current 11th grade students or rising 10th graders register the following day. Um, and the same thing, depending on how many credits you have, it will determine what time you get to register. And then this is um, what the registration portal can look like. I've had, I've seen two different versions of why. So this is what mine looks like. So then you, it will show you um, a, a little menu. You'll click register, you'll select the term and you have to register for full term classes um, because of, because you're a dual enrollment student, you can't register in num, um, smaller terms, the shorter terms, you have to register in a full term. Then you'll click build. And then um, where it says select a course, then find the section is where all the courses that you're eligible to take will show. And then underneath that, that says um, no sections meet this criteria is where the times will be. So typically um, what's highlighted in blue, there'll be a drop down menu of all the classes you're approved to take. I haven't filled out my dynamic form yet, so none of my classes are populating. And then this will be where the times are. You'll click um, the yellow button underneath of that that says add section to trial schedule. And then you will click the continue button at the top. Since there's no classes added to my schedule, I can't confirm it. Then you'll go to the confirm. And since there was no courses, it can't be confirmed, but it would then populate it where you could click like I confirm and it'll be like type your name. So that's that. Um, next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, next, I think next is just questions. So does anybody have any questions that I might be able to answer or um, our PHSC counselor, I think is also on this Zoom um, that he could answer or maybe um, Ms. Yonkoff or anybody? Yeah, so that was excellent, Emily. Thank you. <laughs> excellent. So we do have Mr. Ariaga, who is our PHSC advisor, and um, he's also here for any questions that you might have, or for any of us. Um, I did see in the um, in the chat that there were some people wanting to know if these uh, instructions would be available for students when they're signing up. Maybe not necessarily for summer, but for fall. Our goal is to have a video version of this on our website um, as well, so that a student who didn't get a chance to hear this presentation could access the video of the information that Emily's just shared and then be able to um, walk themselves through the steps. Normally they kind of have to, you know, figure it out on their own, but we wanted to have a little bit more instructional um, help as, um, as we go. So it looks like it says, do students have to pass every per test to take dual enrollment classes? 
So this is a, a kind of a tricky question. And Mr. Ariaga, you can help me if I'm if I'm not for sure. I believe for the first six credit hours, which is um, PHSC credit hours are different than high school credit hours. For the first six credit hours, you only have to pass the reading and the writing PERT test. And then anything after that, you have to pass um, math as well. The first 12 credit hours. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Ms. Simons, can you also give me sharing rights so that I can share my screen as because I have the um, website? I believe oh, yeah. that would be Ms. Watkins. Ms. Watkins. So, Ms. Yonkoff, you should have sharing rights. Uh, April, if you're sharing, maybe you can stop sharing. There I you do. go. There we go. Yay. So while we're answering questions, I just wanted to make sure I had some of, uh, I wanted you to be able to access, see where you can access all this information. It's always been on our website, but not everybody realizes that. So we do have on our website under the students tab, if you scroll down a bit, there's dual enrollment summer. Um, when it's fall registration, I'll say dual enrollment fall for that year. And then we have um, all kinds of tabs for that type of information. And Emily's presentation will be added to this once we have it all in video form. Um, we have the PowerPoint, but we wanna make sure that the, the video with her instructions are also um, part of it. So um, you can see on this, the Pasco County Schools has the information for dual enrollment on that link. And it has all kinds of details. It even has, um, how many credit hours you can sign up for in the summer. It has eligibility criteria that we were talking about with, um, with, the, with the requirements, the uh, GPA and all that, the grades it, um, that they show all the grades for how they, it, they don't report grades through my student, they do it through WISE. Um, and then there's more information if you click on um, the link. Back to our website. I also have um, PHSC's FAQs for um, dual enrollment that Emily referred to already. And that's very helpful for a lot of questions that you might have. I have the steps to take PHSC classes that Emily referred to. Step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven through nine. Um, some of those steps they don't actually do. It might be the counselor or their parent, but um, it is all the steps that must happen before they get fully approved. Registration dates and times. Also, Emily uh, put this on her presentation so you can see exactly when you can register. Um, we have a planning worksheet that is uh, something that we, we let students use this to help make decisions, but this is not required to actually sign up. This is just a paper for to help with planning, but it is not required. It's just a helpful worksheet. Filling that out does not register you for classes. Filling that out gives you um, ideas and organizes your thoughts for registering for classes. And then we do have a link to the dynamic form directly on our website to make things a little bit easier because of how complicated it was to find things um, previously. So all that is on our website under dual enrollment. And Ms. Yonkoff, can you show them where, um, I say under the students, tab mm -hmm. where to get to the college and career website. Oh, right. So same, like this is really um, every student's favorite tab. So at the bottom, um, there's information about college and career. This is where you can get more information about all things that Ms. Simons just talked about and extra link and extra links to everything right here. Um, somebody asked earlier about how to, at, how to make an appointment. Yes. even with your counselor to talk about um, things like dual enrollment. So right here, request an appointment. This is how you can do that to request an appointment with either your counselor or um, Ms. Simons, the college and career specialist and so on and so forth. And so there, and then we, we do plan to put this um, recording in the uh, students tab as well. There's lots of other information here. If you haven't taken the PERT yet, you can actually sign up for the PERT right here under the, the tab. And it's all, everything is in your fingertips right here on, on our website. So you can see signing up and then making sure you show up at that time, date and time that you choose. Here's different dates that you can pick that are remaining for the rest of this school year. Ms. Yonkoff, we did have one more question in the um, chat. Oh yes, I see it. Yeah. Um, okay, so 
mean, Mr. Ariaga might be better at answering this than myself. I do know that the students are supposed to pick um, a like kind of like a, a major or minor that they're actually aiming for, but they don't have to stick with that. Um, some students every once in a while, they do finish their AA, but it isn't necessarily something that we um, fully encourage because it may cause later on for you to end up um, having to pay a lot more for your next college. Ms. Moore actually is more um, knowledgeable about that. Ms. Moore, can you help with the recommendations for um, getting your AA or not? Sure. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Um, what the colleges, and again, I think Mr. Ariaga might be better uh, to answer this question, but the colleges are recommending that students go up to, uh, let's see, what, 48, 48 credit hours? 48 like they, credit hours. Right. They, they don't quite meet the AA. And the reason for that is um, when they are looking at programs that they want to uh, get involved in at their state university, they need to make sure that they fully qualify for that program. And they could, for instance, they could get accepted at USF, but if they want to be in the psychology program, if they don't have the necessary re requirements as a junior for that program, they may end up having to go back to PHSC to take additional courses in order to be uh, able to take that. There's also, my understanding is there's also some uh, possible financial aid implications so that if they take a lot of electives that are not in their chosen major when they finally get to the state university, they may have to pay for those additional courses at the end of their senior year in college. So that's why we said it's probably a good idea to make an appointment with Mr. Ariaga at the college to go over some of these AA implications. It's not always a good idea to actually get your AA when you're in high school. All right, and there was actually a question about um, the scores for the PER, and I was gonna try to find the link for that so I could make sure I give you all of the exact scores. I believe for math, um, it's a 114. For reading, I think it's a 103. And for writing, it's a 106. It might be a 104 for reading, but I wanted to find the exact um, scores. There we are. Ms. Yomkoff, I have Mr. Ariaga with his hands raised. Yes, um, go ahead, Mr. Ariaga. Yes, I, di I didn't want to interrupt, I apologize. So yeah, so you did a very good job of explaining it. Um, in reality, whenever it comes to DE students who are thinking long-term, we do recommend that they speak with us so that we can find a pathway that works for them. Whenever we're looking at students who have already a field that they wanna go into, we can actually go ahead and build something for them so that it caters to what they wanna do and it benefits them. Because yes, it, it's true, a lot of institutions, they have restrictions on students on how many credit hours they have they need to have and if they meet a certain threshold they may not be eligible for certain scholarships or they may not be eligible for certain packages that they may be looking toward so it's good that they speak with us if they already have an idea of which field they want to go into so that we can kind of iron out the different things that can come up in the future and as far as the other questions uh yes when it comes to the PERT exam it's 106 for the reading 103 for the writing, and then for the math, it's 114 for intermediate algebra, and it's 123 for college algebra. And correct, it's 12 credit hours that you can go ahead and take if you have not yet um, it passed the per math. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Ariaga. The, the people um, in somebody in chat would like to know what is the best way to make an appointment with you? Is it through email or through the website? What's the best way? Okay, so um, every student who has, a, who has a student ID number with us, they can access me through the Navigate portal. Uh, do you mind if I share my screen with them? We'll give you access right now. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, there, so there's quite a few different ways. I'm very flexible. So if they would like my email, I can share my screen with them and I can provide them that information. You should be able to share. Do you want to try? There you go. Yes. 
So my email is just a combination of my last name and the first letter of my first name at phsc.edu. So I'm very flexible. If they would just like to go ahead and send me an email, I can always just set an, set an appointment manually. However, if they want to set an appointment via the Navigate system, they could always just go to the main PHSC website and under My PHSC, they can click the student portal. And once they have a uh, student ID number, they can go to Navigate and they can set up an appointment through there. It's basically um, just, just a little portal that allows you to select a date and time that works best for them. And um, I am not the only dual enrollment um, advisor. So if I'm not available, uh, let's say this week, they could always select another dual enrollment advisor and they would be able to help them just as well. I do see that there's another question. Do you mind if I read it? Sure. It says, my son is trying to get a capstone diploma. What would that do for him in college? Okay, so I'm not very sure what the capstone capstone diploma is. I know we have something here, but I don't think it's the same thing. Um, I think that question has to do with AP classes. Am I correct um, for that question? Okay, so for the AP classes, I'll jump in for that. The capstone diploma um, is for AP. It's, it's sort of like a, a way to be equivalent to those students who go through the IB programs or the Cambridge programs. Um, but they do it with AP classes instead. Colleges do um, like to see that, but that is not necessary in order to get into um, a lot of these colleges. It, it might help with um, you know, pushing somebody a little bit over the top to get into one of the colleges. Um, J they also like those, uh, if you're gonna go out of state, um, AP classes are a very good choice because a lot of our dual enrollment classes, in fact, all of our dual enrollment classes do not transfer out of state. Um, and we also don't take dual enrollment classes from other out of other states. So AP is the only way if you wanted to go to another college for another in another state to take college potential college credit with you. Um, and then that capstone diploma would follow you wherever you went, even if it was in another country. Um, so that's one of the benefits of, of AP classes through the capstone um, diploma program. Does that answer your question? Okay, so there's still quite a lot of people here. So if there's anything else you guys have questions about for either myself or Ms. Um, Mr. Ariago or Emily Kirk or Ms. Simons or one of the counselors, um, if you don't have any other questions and you are um, fully informed, feel free to go ahead and leave the chat. We are very happy we're able to be a part of this, but you're welcome to stay on if you do. Are there any further dates that they're going to give the SAT or ACT at the school? It, I know it wouldn't be paid for by the school, but I know sometimes that they administer SATs or ACTs at the school location. So all of the ACT and SAT dates that are on Saturdays are available at ZHS. Um, the school day dates usually only happen once a year okay. or during the school day. Um, but all of the ACT or SAT test dates, um, they can be taken at ZHS, but those are Saturday test dates. Okay. Um, and they can also choose to take any of those Saturday test dates at any other location uh, that has that date available. Okay, thank you. If you have questions, either blurt them out or put it in the chat box. We're all here. I hope this information was helpful for everyone because um, we get more and more questions for dual enrollment all the time. And we're hoping that maybe this could help with answering a lot of those questions. Okay, so a question about senior graduation. You mean for this year or for next year? All right, so for this year, that would be something that's um, different than what's going on in this particular um, 
a Zoom meeting and we're kind of recording it. So I wanna make sure we keep this to the topics. I can definitely help with uh, any questions you have about senior graduation for this year, but um, you would wanna call me and talk with me probably outside of this particular meeting. So if you give me a call um, at the school on Monday or email me, that would be uh, the best way of, of doing that. And I can answer your questions. It's just not for this particular meeting. Okay, so the question about the capstone diploma. Um, so the thing about AP classes is that you're taking college credit classes and you're potentially getting college credit. So if you um, earn the college uh, credit through the AP test that you take, then you would be um, able to translate that into your college um, transcript. So you wouldn't necessarily need to take those classes again in the college that you go to. So it isn't really eliminating or removing prerequisites it's just it's it's taking care of a lot of your gen eds early um so that you don't have to take those in college so it definitely is very helpful um i i took ap classes when i was in high school and i was able to skip um a semester and a half pretty much of of uh, my college and then i took cap uh, um club tests and i skipped another semester so i was able to finish college um a year sooner because of of the of the advancement that I was able to take with AP classes. Other students do the same thing with with PHSC classes, dual enrollment, and some students do a little bit of both, and they're able to mix and match and get some um, advancement that way. And they still have college uh, de, a transcript through both of those, and while they're still in high school. So um, yes, you would actually be able to skip certain classes requirements because you've already met those requirements with your high school. Um, uh, classes that are college credit. If you're taking English Comp 1 in high school, um, that's a that's a dual enrollment class that we offer on our campus. That is a college credit, that's five college credits, um, but it's one high school credit because we do credits differently. So the the English Comp 1 would be would be a, a year of um, credit for us and it would be five credits for PHSC and then English comp two would be the, another five credits for PHSC and a year for us. Am I right on that Mr. Ariaga? It is five credits, correct? Uh, for PHSC English comp one is three credits. And three credits, same. okay. Three credits, but it's a year for us. The math is five. If you take the math, the college algebra, that's the five. College algebra is three credits as well. It's is it? a okay. three calc, the one that's five. Okay. One of them's five, but not that, not the ones I was saying. <laughs> that's why we bring other people along so you can make sure you say things right. All right, anything else? We'll give it another minute. You can always, uh, like I said, sh um, sign up for an appointment with a counselor or with um, Ms. Simons if you have other questions about anything from this presentation. Um, usually the counselors are where you go for the dual enrollment questions. And usually Ms. Simons is where you go for all of the other like schol college scholarships and all that type of question, but both can help with both. Okay, Ms. Simons, I don't see anything else. So as long as um, we are good, we really appreciate everyone coming out tonight and uh, sticking with us for a little while. And I especially thank Emily for being part of the presentation and Mr. Ariaga for rescuing us with some of our questions yes. and, <laughs> and, um, and Ms. Simons for putting all this together too. So we really appreciate all of you and, um, and the other staff members who joined to help out tonight and help um, with everything. So we appreciate you, enjoy your three-day weekend and we'll see everybody on Monday. Bye. Good night, bye now. Bye.